And I sense today in this place, Jehovah, God Almighty. I sense in this place today, the giant killer, the giant slayer, the one that puts the enemy under our feet. I sense in this place today the spirit of victory. Our Heavenly Father today wants us to know, hallelujah, that the victory is ours when we put our hand in His hand, when we put our faith in Him and belief in Him today, that He today is able to do much more abundantly above and beyond what we can ask or think. You see, when it looks like the darkest, when it looks like there's no way, that's what he specializes in. He specializes in bringing the victory out of the ashes of death. He specializes in reversing that which the enemy meant for your harm. He specializes, in, and he has done it time and time and time again. He wants to reassure his people today that he is the giant slayer. And greater is he that is with us than he that is against us. As a matter of fact, there's more that are with us than those that be against us. He's just telling us today to look up and see the salvation of the Lord. Look up and focus upon him today and see him in his glory and see him with his angels and his power and his glory don't focus upon that which you see surrounding you but put your eyes into heaven and see him and what he is doing in your life today he reassures us today and wants us to declare that nothing by any means shall harm you that like in Psalms chapter 91, that he has placed his angels around you that you might not dash your foot upon the stone, that, that even though the plague will not come nigh thee, even though there's thousands that are you're being afflicted by it all around you, God will protect you and watch over you and keep you it was secure in his presence. You're underneath his wings today. And you can just go ahead and repent respond to the devil and say not this time i am a victor in christ i am a conqueror i am more as a matter of fact i am more i am more i am more than a conqueror through christ you see the victory has already been won the victory is already ours but we sometimes, have, in order for us to have a testimony, we have to go through the test. I feel, I feel victory in this place today. I feel the presence of God reassuring us not to give up and not to focus upon, oh, the focus upon everything that looks negative, but go ahead and get yourself a little bit of positivity today in your attitude and in your thoughts, and don't let that positivity be shaken Hallelujah today, but have faith in God that He is able to do a powerful and a mighty thing in your life. That's the God that we serve. We serve an awesome Heavenly Father and Savior today that already has the answer in the palm of His hand. Kind of reminded of 
Johnny Fulton. He was run over by a car at the age of three. He suffered crushed hips and broken ribs and fractured skull and compound fractures in his legs and throughout his body. It, as a matter of fact, it looked like he wouldn't even live. But Johnny Fulton, there's something about him that he just wouldn't give up. And later on in life, he recovered and he ran the half a mile in less than under two minutes. You see, there's something about not giving up, about relying upon God. Walt Davis, no relation to me, was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old. But he did not give up. As a matter of fact, he became an Olympic high jump championship in 1952. I kind of think that we need more of these kind of stories on the news that tells about the Spirit of God and about not giving up, but knowing that God, uh, hallelujah, that we can do much more abundantly, that He strengthens us and He sustains us and He keeps us. Uh, Oh, hallelujah, when we put our hand in His hand, He is able to take us across the finish line. When we have faith in Him, He is able to strengthen and sustain us. As a matter of fact, His Word says that His grace is sufficient. Lou Gehrig. He was such a clumsy ball player that the boys in his neighborhood would not let him play on their team. You ever had that happen? You're like the last one to be picked, and you're thinking, what? Amen. You ever, 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 ever? But he was committed. He did not give up, and eventually his name was entered into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson could not read when he was 10 years old, but he was committed. He believed that he, he could conquer, he could overcome, and he became the 28th president of the United States. See, sometimes we have a tendency to give up right on the brink of victory in our lives. But we have to have a determination, a commitment in our spirit and in our heart that we will not give in, we will not give up, give up, and we will not give over to the enemy any territory in our life that we have gained, but we are going to stand firm and we're going to stand tall and we're going to keep believing that God is able in our lives and in our hearts to bring a miracle in our life. We go through challenges, we go through things, and there's been many overcomers in the Bible, this book uh, that we read and that we believe in. But one of those, that the story of one of these really stands out. And my favorite one in the Old Testament is the story of David, King David. He fought a lot of battles in his life, but one of those stuck out, really stood out, and that was the battle against Goliath. We've heard this story time and time again, amen? But it's about being an overcomer. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, God today is able to help us to cross the finish line. And we just need to continue to have faith and to trust in Him, knowing that we are in His perfect will. Hallelujah. No matter what storms are, are abating against you today, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter how dark it looks, God is able today to bring victory in your life. But like I said earlier, we have to sometimes go through the test in order to have the testimony. There's many overcomers right in the Bible, but David, he had to face Goliath. Now the overcomer's challenge in David's life was simply one that is a classic in the presentation of life even we see Israel and we see there's a place, a, it's like a deep ravine. And in this picture of David and Goliath, there's, a, you know, there's an army on one side, the Israelites, and then there's the army of the Philistines on the other. And in between them is a gulf. It's like a, you know, like a hundred yards between them, kind of like a football field in length. And 
for six days and six nights, Goliath would come out and, and kind of speak to the Israelites and say, is anybody going to fight me? Is anybody strong enough to come against me? And, and we find in the Bible that that never happened. Not one of the Israelites came to, you know, to, and believed in God enough to fight this battle that was before them. It's taken out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you'll turn in your Bible, it's about a boy fighting a giant. It's really the conflict of the ages of what we face today, the battle that has raged ever since Satan rebelled against God and the story of good versus evil and the story of uh, living by faith in God that He will take you through uh, every challenge that you face and that He will give you victory in your life. How many of you know today that it's God that sustains you? That it's God that keeps you? That it's God that gives you the strength to endure in the face of the most difficult circumstances sometimes, but we have to rely upon Him and ask Him for sustaining strength and sustaining power in order to get through at times. Amen? But let's start to look at this giant Goliath. Now, some people say, you know, obviously he was on the Philistine side, and some people say maybe he was like a mercenary that the Philistines hired. They thought, yeah, let's get this big old 10-foot giant to come up against Israel. It'll scare the pants off of them. Right? So they hired possibly Goliath as a mercenary. But 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 4, it says, We're told that he went out from the camp of the Philistines from Gath, and his height was six cubits in a span. I don't know about you, I, when I get out my tape measure, it doesn't have cubits or a span on it. Right? Most of us don't measure things in cubits and spans. So let me kind of translate here. Most of the people at that time were like five foot tall, all right? But the measurements of Goliath put him at about 10 or 11 feet tall. I think that's pretty substantial as far as a giant, amen? If you kind of look at the, base, the game of basketball, of a hoop is 10 foot tall, so he'd be scraping his head on the hoop. I'm pretty sure he could dunk a ball. Amen? But here he was, and it said that he had a weight of, a, his coat was the weight of 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and a, a bronze javelin between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear, it says, was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed about 600 shekels. And a shield bearer was before him. And you can imagine what it would be like to be up against this 10 foot giant, right? I'm pretty sure that if you were facing a 10 foot giant, you probably, you know, your first instinct and first thought would be, I ain't going up against him. Amen. But then it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 8 Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why? This is, this is a. Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then you will be our servants. But if, or we will be your servants. But if I prevail against you and kill him, then you shall be our servants. He roared, you know, his big voice and and I'm sure that the Israelites heard his voice for six days and six nights, it says. And the Israelites were intimidated, right? It's easy to get intimidated in life. And you're not sure about what's going on. Um, hallelujah. But the overcomer's challenge is, you know, you can't just sit there and think about Goliath. Get a good picture in your mind of this gigantic, brutal man, uh, probably weighing four to 500 pounds. And, you know, he, he had this... You know, he, his, he had this awesome, you know, this look that was just brutish and powerful and mighty. But in the standing in the valley of Elah, between the armies on both sides, there was the overcomer's challenge is going to take some kind of warrior, some kind of person or individual 
and he did not exist at that time in Saul's army. But David, let's look at David, the youngest son of Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, as you remember, and David has been appointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. He's been anointed, but there's never, he doesn't become a king for 15 years. His time for ruling had not come yet, and he was still living at home. But when David's father sent him on this errand, oh, it must have been thrill, thrilling, I'm thinking, for David at that time. He's, he ran, he runs, off, runs off with his errand. You know, he's going to go to get to see what's going on in the valley there between Goliath, between the Philistines and the nation of Israel. And he's, he's really excited as a young boy, I'm pretty sure. And he's probably thinking in his mind, why can't I go to war? Why can't I? Why do I have to tend the sheep while my brothers are off having all the fun? And when he gets there, they're talking and he hears them and Goliath strolls out on the battlefield and he begins to shout the challenge. And David seemed kind of shocked that nobody from the side of Israel even responded. So we ask one of the men around him, and here's what it says in Scripture. He says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? And the soldier responded and says, well, I think, uh, you know, the king kind of said that if whoever takes on this man and kills him will get great riches. And as a matter of fact, he's going to give his daughter to be in marriage if you'll kill him. And here's the best part of all. You'll never have to pay taxes again. Amen? I'm thinking, I'll just go ahead and do that even if I die. Right? But listen, David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David asking about the reward, and he became furious. In verse 28 it says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Oh, and David answered this in verse 29. He says, What have I done now? <laughs> Man, I'm just down here because my... Dad told me to come down here. What have I done now? I just asked him some questions, dude. And then he says, is there not a cause? It's a brilliant answer, really, to be honest. Because he says, don't be angry at me. He says, isn't there something more important for us to be thinking about? About maybe thinking about why that the enemy's been being, being able to keep bringing threats against me and or against the Israelites, thinking about why somebody hasn't gone down into the battlefield in the name of the Lord and took care of that booger? Amen? When a man or a woman, listen to me, when a man or a woman decides to be a champion for God, they set themselves up for a lot of heat and criticism. David tells us that we have to stand firm in our convictions even when the closest people to us are telling us, no, you can't do that. That's not possible. Over the years in my life and in leading and doing things for God, I've experienced heat and criticism when I do what God has called me to do. When the people sometimes that are closest to us try to talk us out from doing what God has called us to do. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that something you would think that, you know, they'd be on your side, but a lot of times they're too afraid to do what God has called them to do. So they don't want you to do what God has called you to do. So they sit back and the only thing they can do is continue to complain about what you're doing. Now you see, the Bible describes Goliath by his size, his sight, and his shout. But the Bible describes David by his courage, his conviction, and his confidence. The Bible describes Goliath by his physical attributes, but the Bible describes David by his spiritual attributes. Because spiritual is more important than physical. And they're very important. That's an important point to remember, amen? Amen. Well, one of the things that David had that Goliath didn't have was a sling. Matter of fact, Moses had a walking stick. 
David had a sling. Samson had the jawbone of a donkey. Rahab had a string. Mary had some perfume. Dorcas had a needle. All were used by God. What do you have? What has God placed in your hand that you're saying isn't enough to get the battle and the job done? The Lord is saying, I've given you enough. Everything that I have given you, I can use for my glory to slay the devil and to slay the enemy. The Bible says that David headed for the plain, and on the way, he stopped at a brook uh, and gathered five smooth stones because David knew that Goliath had some big brothers. Uh, and how many of you know that when you begin to attack one family member, the brothers are going to come? So David thought, I'll just go ahead and get rid of them all at once. Instead of coming back to the brook, uh, I'm going to get five smooth stones, and that's all I need. Uh, one bullet, one shot. Hallelujah. Glory be to God, and God is going to give in the name of Jesus, God is going to give me, hallelujah, the power and the wisdom and the ability to shoot straight and to knock the devil down and the enemy down with one shot in the name of Jesus. Praise his holy name. So David had a sling in his hand and he approached Goliath. When Goliath saw David, he was insulted. Read the scripture, it's graphic. It says in verse 43, he says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks and stones? <laughs> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods, most likely Dagon. And he began to goad David even more. And in verse 44, he says, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Just imagine with me for a minute, Goliath, he's been coming to that valley, remember, for six days and six nights, waiting for somebody to show up who would be willing to fight. But on this day, all he sees is a little boy. Oh, hallelujah, all he sees is a little boy. No shield, no sword, and the Bible says he disdained disdain David or in other words he curled up his lip and thought am I a dog that you send out a, a little child to fight the battle but guess what that's all that God needs uh, hallelujah in order hallelujah in the name of Jesus for victory to come is when we put our hand in his hand little as much uh, hallelujah and he is able hallelujah to bring forth victory what looks foolish uh, to the world is wisdom to God and he already knows what it's going to take so don't discount that thing in your hand that God has given you because he is going to bring victory out of the little through his power and his glory because it is not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord God of hosts and there's no devil in hell that can withstand one breath or one word from an almighty God that only begins to breathe and topple down the giants that are in your life today in verse 45 it says then david said to the philistine you come to me with a sword and with the spear mm -hmm, and a javelin but i come to you in the name of the lord of hosts the god of the armies of israel whom you have defiled whom you have defiled, whom you have defiled, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you. Oh, and I will take your head from you, and this day I will give your carcass and your flesh to, in the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. Hallelujah. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, or spear for the battle, it says, for the battle is the Lord's. Uh, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I trust uh, in the name of the Lord my God. Uh, hallelujah. And he will give uh, me into your, he will give you into our hands. That was David's speech. Amen. 
Now, I don't know if you get this, folks, but David had just infuriated the biggest bully around. Oh, he just stood up and he just went ahead and gave him a speech right from the Word of God. <laughs> and guess what? If God isn't who he says he is, David is as good as dead. David is history. He's out of here. Amen? But he purposely intimidated Goliath and doing so set himself up to win the battle. Notice what happens next. The Bible says that, that Goliath moved towards David. And then the Bible says that David ran, ran toward the giant. Verse 48 so it was when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Let's just go ahead and take this down right now. I ain't got time for you to get from here to there. I'm coming to you, and you're coming down. Amen? You see, that boy began to run towards a hallelujah like a warrior. Oh, hallelujah, he didn't have on Saul's fancy breastplate. He didn't have Saul's fancy weapon. Oh, no, he turned those down. Hallelujah, but he took what he was comfortable with because David was a man that had already done battle in the spiritual. He was a man that spent time in prayer. He already knew how to knock down some of those uh, hallelujah forces of darkness when they came, and he was already comfortable with the power of prayer and the power of the anointing of God and he knew what he had to do and this was just one more battle it wasn't a giant but it was just one more battle for God to show his power and his glory don't look at the size of the giant but look at the size of the Lord God Almighty in heaven and see that he is able hallelujah to take you through take you beyond and into the victory walk and the victory march because he says you are more than a conqueror through Christ David didn't stop running. Quickly, he ran. He got to the right place. He stopped. He reached his hand in the bag of stones, and he picked out a stone and put it in his sling. And remember, David was already comfortable with his weapon. He already knew how to use it. He knew from years of experience of slaying, hallelujah, the lion on the sheep field and the slaying the bear. When they came to try to against his sheep, David already had the weapons of his warfare perfected so that the devil was not able to take that which was his. And guess what? The Bible says that he struck the Philistine in the forehead and that stone sank into his forehead and Goliath fell on his face to the earth. You see, as overcomers, we fight a battle like David. And I know, hallelujah, I know, hallelujah, this story. I like to tell it because it's fun to tell. Hallelujah, I like it every time. I like to tell the story of the victory. Oh, hallelujah, and the past victories the Lord has done in my life. Just like you like to tell the stories of the victories when God, just when you thought it was over, just when it was the darkest it could get, just when you thought there's no way God showed up, uh, hallelujah, he showed up just in time. He showed up and delivered you from the snare of the fowler. He was able, hallelujah, to do. And guess what? Sometimes, uh, oh, hallelujah, we go from one level to the next level because God is training you. He is perfecting you he's taken to you a place where you have unshakable faith that he will take you through whatever he has called you to do and he wants you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt hallelujah that he will slay the giants that are in front of you just keep looking to him and not to the giant amen we've all felt like david at times We're talking about overcomers. He overcame a giant that nobody gave him any chance of overcoming. How do we wrap this story again around our lives? <clears throat> like a flour tortilla. 
Amen. How do you take the principles of the story and wrap them around your life? How do you apply them? A bunch of tacos. <laughs> you see, David did it by the hand of the Lord. Number one, what's the first thing we need to do? Is don't get discouraged by your friends. If God tells you something to do, then that's the truth. Sometimes people aren't going to understand it. I've made moves in my life. I've given up job, good jobs. Well, well, faith can't pay your bills. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, what else is? <laughs> Sometimes I have a harder time paying my bills when I'm doing a good job than when I'm living by faith. Amen? So number one, don't get discouraged what other people might be saying. Number two, it's all right to talk to God about your problems, but sometimes you need to talk to your problems about your God. You need to begin to declare in the name of Jesus uh, and preach to them uh, Hallelujah about your God, that he is uh, an awesome God. Hallelujah that he says in his word that he will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And I will begin to proclaim the victory of the cross that was won 2,000 years ago that Jesus went down to Hades and to hell and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and that my Bible tells me that I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ and I'm going to let the power of God take me through this. I'm not going to go around it. I'm not going to go above it or under it, but I'm going through it in the name of Jesus Christ, and he's going to be beside me. He's going to be in me, and he's going to be all around me, and I'm going to see victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Refuse to get discouraged and reinforce your focus on God. And number three, we need to have a re retelling of our previous victories in our life what God has already done uh, and how he has already how did you get to this point already because God has brought you from here to there he showing you and helping you to experience a miracle after miracle by his power and by his glory and he's right now working out for you that miracle for you to see the victory and the power of God uh, oh how many times has we, have we seen where it looks like they're down and out and there's no way hallelujah but guess what my God is a finisher my God is a redeemer my God is the one that raises that which is dead and brings it to life my God is an awesome God hallelujah and I'll continue to preach and continue to proclaim the victories that God has already done in my life he says in his word that I've never seen the righteous forsaken God will help you God will supply the need and he'll make a way where there seems to be no way see a lot that people today want to take their problems to Facebook instead of facing them instead of going through them and facing them with God they want to take it to Facebook wrong place man yeah. Don't declare your problems to Facebook. Declare them to God. And then declare the power and the victory of God. And how God is able. In verse 34, the first Samuel chapter 17, it says, But David said to Saul, You see, David was rehearsing what he had already experienced and what the victory is in his life. In verse 34, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, uh, I clocked them in the head, and they died, and my sheep were protected. Because my God, I relied upon him, and they weren't able to take my sheep. My God is able today to what? 
He's able to do uh, much more abundantly what you can ask or think. Don't look at the size of the giant. Oh, it could be 50 feet tall. It doesn't matter to God, 100 foot tall. Size does not matter to God. What matters to God is our confidence and belief and faith in Him that He is able. Here comes the fourth one. Run towards your problems. Oh, what? I'm like an ostrich. I like to put my head in the sand. There ain't nothing going around. Everything's good. Everything's good. Nothing going on here. <laughs> right? That's why a lot of us got sand in our eyes. But re David ran. David learned. You know, he was out there tending his sheep. And he learned that when he first saw a lion, it wasn't going to do no good to go back and hide behind a rock. Because the lion was coming. So either he was going to do something, or he was going to die, right? So David learned, and I'm sure he, the first time he seen one, he had his sling, and he, he had been practicing on that target in the backyard, you know, with that target, you know, and he was... It was pretty good. He was starting to hit the bullseye, and, but he never really had to face a lion before. And I'm pretty sure the first, I don't know about you, but if I'm fate, I don't care what day it is. If, I'm, if a lion's coming at me the for the first time, I'm, like, I'm not like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, come on. No, I don't think so. But here's what David did. Oh, Lord, I pray right now that you would guide my hand. Father, help me right now to slay this enemy, this lion that is coming right now in the name of Jesus. He took it. <laughs> Boom. That's what David did. And after a few of those, he's like, yeah. I don't have confidence in myself, but I got confidence in God. That he's got this thing. And maybe I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that probably once or twice David had to fight off a couple of them at once. He had one in both hands. He said, okay, Lord, I've done it with one hand. Help me with both. <laughs> because God sometimes increases our faith by what we face. Right? I mean, every morning. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know that joy comes in the morning? After the battle? After the test? After the fight? We need to have faith and put our faith and our trust and run towards our problems, embrace them, confront them. I've just learned it's better to face your problems. They ain't going away. I don't know about you, but they just keep coming up. You can't postpone them. You know, you can't ignore them. They just keep, la they're just there all the time. They don't quit. You have to face them head on at times. And then watch God go to work on your behalf. Problems don't go away, but God can deal with them if you put them in His hand. Verse 45. And when you're running towards your problems, be sure to remember... For whom you're fighting. David said in verse 45, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. All this assembly shall know. All this assembly shall know. All this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is his, and, and he will give you into my hand. What a difference it would make if we faced all of our challenges like David did. Lord, for your honor and for your glory, I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to face my battles in the power of your name and I'm going to trust you to help me to, to overcome the giants in my life. You see, we find a strategy here in the Bible, a path for the overcomers, a, how to overcome, how to be victorious, how to 
get through, sometimes we got a breakthrough in order to have a breakthrough. Woo! That was profound. We got to go through in order sometimes to have a breakthrough. We got to go through what we're going through in order to have victory in our life. Remember, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7, it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And then I read another scripture. <laughs> it said this. If you overcome, I'm going to let you sit with me on my throne. What? He's going to let you sit with him on his throne. To the overcomers. To those. Because with God it says that we must have faith. He that believes in God must believe that he is and that what? That he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We diligently seek him because we know that He will help us to be victorious in whatever we're facing and we don't give up in the midst of the problem or because we know that our solution to our problem is Him. And we stand fast and tall in what God is telling us to do that we will be victorious and that we will inherit. What does it say? And He will inherit all things. You're an inheritor. You're going you're to inherit. You might not have a lot now. You might not have a lot now. <laughs> but it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Quit fighting over your grandma's money. See, we're called to be overcomers, not undercomers. Amen? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. God is not partial to David. What He did for David, He'll do for us. You see, God has so many ways of manifesting Himself and revealing Himself. And one of those that I spoke on earlier is that he's a finisher he finishes that which he starts right you might be in a situation right now today that it seems like the devil is winning and you're running out of hope and rope what did abraham lincoln say if you're running out of rope tie a knot on the end and keep hanging on You might feel like you're running out of hope and rope. Amen? Your situation might seem impossible, but it's not over until God finishes or signs off. Everybody around you may be in agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody oh, might be in agreement around you about what's going on today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody might say it's too late. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Everybody might be in agreement and saying it's too late, but guess what? That which God started in the birth, the womb of freedom, oh, hallelujah, he will finish it. Uh, oh, hallelujah, to his glory and to his name. Just think about the Israelites in Exodus chapter 14. Uh, oh, when they came, uh, hallelujah, to the Red Sea, uh, I'm pretty sure old Pharaoh thought he had it all figured out that, oh, hallelujah, he was able to stuff the scales. And he was going to win. <laughs> but God, hallelujah, has a way, oh, hallelujah, to bring victory 
in our lives and in our hearts. We just have to have faith in Him and realize that what God started in the Israelites, surely He wasn't going to have them be defeated in the midst of the wilderness. Oh, He delivered them with a Passover angel in Egypt. Now do you think that God was going to let them get killed in the wilderness? No. God has a plan and sometimes He takes us so oh, by way of the Red Sea. Even when we think there's a, you know, only, only was supposed to take like 12 days for them to get from Egypt to Israel. But guess what? God took them the long way. He's think, he was thinking, I'm going to take you where you can have some new views and new places to be because I'm going to try you and I'm going to help you to become more like me. Hallelujah. Sometimes God takes us by way of the Red Sea and we get pinned in and it looks like it's over. But guess what? What is impossible with man is possible with God. You see, God is able. Just when you thought it was over. Just when you thought there was no way. Just like when Mary, in John chapter 11, Jesus was told that Lazarus had died. He waited for four days. Who does that? He waited till there was absolutely no doubt that Lazarus was dead dead he didn't want the you know he didn't want the uh caretakers to come and say well he just he wasn't really dead i know he hadn't been breathing for four days but he was just kind of resting at a, a peaceful state and no he wanted to show he wanted to show that no matter how dead it is Nothing, nothing is impossible with him. Don't give up. Have faith that he is able to move in your life. Jehoshaphat, all he had to do in the Bible was believe, and the victory was his. He was outnumbered, outgunned, oh, all around him. He was outgunned, and it looked like it was over. The enemy had surrounded him, but God didn't sign off on it that day. Jehoshaphat's destruction was not that day in the hand of God. No matter what your circumstance looks like today, Hallelujah, God has a different plan. We just have to have faith because He is the finisher of our destiny and of our life. 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha and his servant were surrounded. And Elisha's servant was getting nervous. You ever get nervous? Oh boy. How is this going to work out? But his eyes just had to be opened. And what did he see? He seen that all of those that were surrounding him, well, guess what? God was surrounding them. You see, there are more that are with us than those that be against us. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I am make, he says in his word, I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Are you in a wasteland? Well, guess what? God is making a way, and He's making a way, hallelujah, to bring you victory, to bring your anointing, to bring His presence and His power in your life, and He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. In the toughest situations. You see, that's what God specializes in. He specializes in the toughest of situations, of circumstances and situations that are out of your control, that are out of your ability, that are out of any way possible for you to overcome. He specializes 
and those things, and he's got it figured out so you don't have to worry. He's got it in the palm of his hand, and he's working on your behalf right now. He has a plan and a purpose for you. Whatever you're going through today, he's got a clear-cut pathway for you to have victory. Let's stand today in the most seemingly hopeless situation, whatever it might be. When we allow God's power and His grace to give His light the ability to shine through in the darkness uh, in our lives, when we don't rely upon our own abilities, our own strength, uh, whatever those might be, because God today is making a way in the wilderness and He's causing, oh hallelujah, the streams to rise up and He's bringing refreshing right now in the desert times. He can make a way in the wilderness uh, Oh, hallelujah, what, is it, what does the thing say? It says, if, if you, in life, if you've been given lemons, make lemonade. Oh, hallelujah, take your circumstances and your situations, hallelujah, and let the master lemonade maker make lemonade out of your, the things that you're going through, right? Because he is able, quit. sometimes we just have to change how we're looking at things. You know what my grandpa always told me when things weren't working out? He says, because you're not holding your face right. I don't know how many times he told me that. And I never got it till later. You're not holding your face right. I'm like, a little little boy, I'm like, okay, let me try it this way. Or let me try No. Sometimes it's our perception of what we're seeing, what we're going through. And sometimes we have to visualize. You see, if God can split the sea, if He can move mountains, if He can take care of the barriers, if He can take you through... The, the dry land, the desert, if he can conquer a giant and bring victory to his children, if he can close the mouth of a lion and provide safety, if he can open the prison door and set you free, if he can protect us from the flames of, of adversity, if he can carry you through the storm, he's the God of miracles. And he never changes. He's the same yesterday today and forever he never changes I don't know what your giant is today I've got a few in my life but none of these giants intimidate the God of heaven and none of these giants can defeat you if you stand in the strength of the Lord so as we go through these things in our life we're gonna see how Almighty God helps us overcome our weaknesses and he supplies the strength he helps us to overcome our anxieties with peace he helps us to secure hallelujah that peace that passes all understanding no matter what we're facing and no matter what we're going through he simply wants us to grab a hold of the anchor oh hallelujah the anchor of our souls oh hallelujah that says that when we grab a hold of that anchor it doesn't matter the storm of life that we're going through we know that we are secure that we are held fast hallelujah in the author and the finisher of our faith and he is perfecting us and we will reach the destination the finish line because when we're walking and talking with him he's going to take us all the way hallelujah to glory but on the way he is perfecting us making us into the image of christ Let's close our eyes today. How many of you would say, I'm facing a giant today, but I know, I know today beyond a shadow of a doubt that the giant slayer lives within me. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that he will show up. uh, Hallelujah. When I begin to run towards my enemy and face him, he's going to show up on the battlefield and he will slay the giant uh, that I am facing today. Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
Father, we pray, Lord God, today for a mighty outpouring of your Spirit, a mighty outpouring of your grace. Father, we pray today that you would reassure our hearts and reassure our minds, Lord, that you have, Lord God, all of this in the palm of your hand. We cast all of our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us, knowing, Father, today that you, Lord God, are going before us uh, and you are preparing the way. Father, oh, hallelujah. You're bringing down, Lord God, the giant in our life, uh, that thing, that circumstance, that thing, whatever it might be, we know, Lord, uh, that you are the giant slayer and you're going to bring it down when we face it, when we go through the battle, knowing that you it will bring glory to your name. We honor you. Lord, Father, that thing, oh, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak it and we declare it right now that there is victory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, we declare right now, Lord, Father, God, it is not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit. And we know, Father, the battle is not ours, but it is yours. We put our hand in your hand today.